And we'll have more here tonight. Starting off a little wacky this year because the pandemic has hit. It's killed off nearly all of our church membership. No, actually it hasn't. We're, we're kind of, you know, if you want to wear a mask, you're, you're fine. We're, we're trying to just let everybody have freedom to either wear it or not wear it, whatever you want to do. And uh, you're responsible for your own health. We're not making promises that you won't get sick, but we're certainly not saying you will get sick. And so if you go to Walmart, you're probably pretty safe here. And uh, if you go to Lowe's, you're still pretty safe here. So we're going to have a good time this week. We're expecting the Lord's going to do some great things for us. And Brother Ed Dunlop's with us. He comes every uh, two years and holds a family crusade. And he'll tell you about inviting people and bringing people. And we're going to we want to kind of get a few more people here, don't we? Nod your head if you're in agreement with me. <laughs> and we'll get a few more folks here. Brother Ed's been with us every two years for a long, long time, and we're glad he's here today. This is Ed Dunlop, his wife, Mrs. Dunlop, is with us, and uh, I think they've got Andy the Dummy here, too, and so maybe you'll get to be introduced to him before the day's over. Brother Ed Dunlop. Well, good morning. It is good to have you here this morning. We're praying for a good week. We've been anticipating this for quite a while, looking forward to it. So I want to ask you to do three things. Number one, please come, set aside some other things, turn off the TV, and come every single night. Amen. Now, if I'm understanding right, we're starting at 6 o'clock tonight, is that correct? And going until 7.30, we'll dismiss promptly at 7.30. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we'll start at 7 o'clock and dismiss at 8.30. Okay, so note that time change. Tomorrow night will be uh, an hour later than it is tonight, okay? And again, I'm asking you to do three things. Number one, as I mentioned, please come every night if you possibly can. You know, don't quit a second shift job, but turn off the TV, cancel sporting events, plan to be here, okay? Secondly, please come praying. The devil's working in our midst, isn't he? He's trying to destroy this nation. He's trying to destroy young people. And the reason we're here, look past the fun and the games, the magic and all that. The reason we're here is to preach the gospel and see people saved. In the crusade this past week, just a couple days ago, they told me they had four young people saved. We did a big rally on, on Saturday, a week ago yesterday, and they had like 250 kids come and had nine of them get saved. Okay, that's why we're here is to help people get saved, okay? And so thirdly, if you know somebody's not saved, you're not sure they are, invite them to come. Invite them to come. They'll hear the gospel, and the rest is up to the Holy Spirit of God, isn't it? We were in a little country church in Ganson, Alabama, years ago. It wasn't a large church. On Sunday morning, their, their Sunday morning attendance, which is their high attendance for the week, was 53 people. Okay, So it was just a moderate church, not, not a real big church. We had 159 people on Wednesday night. Exactly three times what their Sunday morning service attendance was. And if I remember right, we had 51 people saved. A lot of kids, some teenagers, and even some of the bus parents got saved that week. And you know what the key was? The people in the church brought people. A man came up to me on Tuesday night after the service. We had three services, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. He came up to me on, Wednesday, on Tuesday night after service, and he had tears in his eyes. He said, Brother Ed, I've been saved for about two years now. The last six months or so, I've been asking, Lord, Lord, how can I serve you? I love you. What can I do for you? And with tears in his eyes, he said, he said, I found out this week I can invite people to church and see them get saved. Yeah. Then he laughed, and he said, also found out this week the maximum number of people you can put in a Ford Bronco is 11. <laughs> well, I went back to the same church two years later. On a Sunday morning, they had 120 people, 120 the first morning. They were running a bus. The man who had the Ford Bronco is now running a bus. And the pastor told me, he said, most of the growth in the last two years has been the people who got saved during that crusade. And what was the key? The people in the church got excited. They brought people. They saw the purpose. And they, they set aside other things. It just, it just came and came and came and brought people. And we had a great week. Take your Bible, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 18 for a moment. Matthew chapter 18. I had somebody share this with me several years ago. I thought it was kind of humorous. It's called anagrams. An anagram is when you take a word or phrase and you rearrange the letters in the word or phrase and form a new word or a new phrase. For instance, if you take the word dormitory, rearrange letters in the word dormitory, you come up with dirty room. You ever been to college? You know that one's appropriate, okay? The Morse code, rearrange the letters, you get here come dots. Listen becomes silent. We can learn from that one, okay? And uh, here's what I'm not sure if I like this one or not, preacher. Evangelist becomes evil's agent. I don't think I like that one. Now, here's one that is appropriate. Slot machines. Rearrange the letters of the word slot machines, the term slot machines. You come up with cash lost in me. That one fits. A decimal point becomes I'm a dot in place. 11 plus 2. Now, this is amazing. What would be, what would be the sum of 11 plus 2? 13. Rearrange the letters. You come up with 12 plus 1, and the sum is still 13. Okay? Now, here's everyone's favorite. Mother-in-law. 
Please don't take offense here. Mother-in-law, rearrange the letters you come up with. <laughs> I told you that with everybody. Say, you can do people's names, okay? A Presbyterian, by the way, becomes best in prayer. I don't think I agree with that one, but anyway. Uh, the eyes, they see. Now, you'll love this next one. George Bush. He bugs gore. How about this one? Election results. you like this one. Lies. Let's recount. Check it out. Okay, and people's names. Tom Cruise. So I'm cuter. Clint Eastwood, Old West action. That one fits, huh? Uh, how about this one? Osama bin Laden, old man in a base. Elvis Aaron Presley, seen alive? Sorry, pal. You can do it even with the names of people that you know. For instance, Pastor Rick Brooks. And this is a little bit strange, but here we got a brisk sport crook. <laughs> I think that means he cheats at football. I think that's what it means there. <laughs> But there we are, there we are. Sing with me if you would. I love this song. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please Him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for... Watch these words. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I owe no other master. My heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. And why do we serve the Lord Jesus? Because of Calvary. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer his call, follow his leading, and give him my all. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, for thou in thy thyself I own no other throne. My life I give for to live. O Christ, for thee alone. Look at Matthew chapter 18 and just one verse to, to serve time. Matthew chapter 18, look at verse 14 with me, please. Would you read the, loud, the verse aloud with me, please? Matthew 18 and verse 14 together. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. One more time, if you would, together. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Our topic this morning for the first part of the Sunday School Hour, presenting the gospel to children. How do you reach children with the gospel? Lord, I pray that you bless our time together this morning. Holy Spirit, we invite you to be here, to speak through us, to speak to hearts. And Lord, as we go through the crusade this week, help us to reach out and reach as many young people and parents as we possibly can with the gospel. Give us a burden for those around us who are not yet saved. And Lord, again, right now, we're asking you to speak to our hearts and give us a burden. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let me start by asking a question. Would you agree with this statement? Even a child of five, if properly instructed, can as truly believe and be regenerated as an adult. Is that true? Can a five-year-old get saved? Yeah. Five is pretty young, isn't it? I got saved at home when I was four years old, but my dad read the Bible to us every morning and every evening. My mom had gospel music playing a good part of the day, KHEP Radio, Phoenix, Arizona. My dad had us in church every time the doors were open. And one day on a Saturday morning, my mom was doing dishes. I went to her and said, Mom, would you show me how to get saved? She dried her hands on the dish towel, took a Bible, and very carefully went through some scriptures in Romans and showed me how to get saved. I didn't understand the whole Bible. I could not define the word propitiation for you. Could you define it for me right now? Boy, you're four years old. I knew I was a sinner. The verse my mom showed me told me Jesus died and rose again, and I believed that. And kneeling beside a little couch, I just asked the Lord Jesus to be my Savior. Four years old. 
know what God did? He forgave my sin forever. I am forgiven. He gave me a home eternal in heaven, gave me eternal life, and he actually adopted me into his family. When I get saved, I became a child of God. I'm his son. He's my father. Amen. If you've been saved, you're a child of God. If you're not yet saved, you can become a child of God by receiving Jesus as your Savior. He wants to adopt you in his family. Can a child of five get saved? Yeah. Oh, yes. The key is that second line, if properly instructed. Don't bring a four-year-old child or a five-year-old child in on a church van and then the very first Sunday they hear try to lead them to the Lord. Sometimes in our zeal we make mistakes, don't we? Especially, especially young children, they'll very slowly, very carefully. You present the gospel. You let the Holy Spirit of God be the one that draws that child to the Savior. We're never trying to talk them into it or trick them or coerce them. It's the Holy Spirit drawing them. The man who made this statement, of course, was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, London preacher. Years ago, a group did a survey in Bible preaching churches across America. And they asked the question, if you've been saved, if you are a child of God, at what age did you get saved? Here's the results of their survey. They found in America, basically 1% of those who do get saved do so in early childhood. I would fit in that category. They found only 10% of Americans who do get saved do so during the teen and young adult years. They found furthermore that only 4%, 4% of those who do get saved do so at age 30 or later. In America, according to this survey, 85% of those who do get saved do so between the ages of 5 and 14. The period of life referred to as childhood. Are your children's ministries important? Oh, yes. For one thing, they're very, very fruitful. That's the time to reach the American with the gospel. But secondly, these are ministries that are very close to the heart of our Savior. Look at verse 14 again. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. What is the last word in the verse? The same word you find in John 3.16. What does it mean? It means to die lost, to die without Christ, to die unsaved. When a person dies unsaved, be it a child, be it a teenager, be it an adult, they're condemned to hell, aren't they? But then on judgment day, worse than that, they're condemned to the lake of fire forever. That's the word perish. Jesus said, it's not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. I think it was six summers ago, James Dobson shared this. He told us that the builder generation, that's the Americans, born from 1927 to 1945, he says in America, 65% of them are evangelical Christians. Now, focus on the family would have cast a pretty broad chant, probably includes some people that don't really know the Lord, but stay with us, you'll see where he's going with this, okay? He tells us that the boomers, born from 46 to 64, 35% of them have been reached. Generation X, born from 65 to 76, only 16%. The Bridgers, born from 77 to 94. You're not ready for this. 4%. Do you see and understand what's happening in America? We who have the gospel, the good news of Calvary, the offer of salvation as a free gift, and what a glorious gospel that is. We're somehow failing to take the gospel to the next generation. Now, if the Bridgers are there, where would the millennials be? I'd be afraid to even ask. On an average day in America, and I'm going to try to give you a burden for what we're doing this week with the crusade and to see what, 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 what can be done. And then in a few minutes, we'll kind of change direction. But on an average day in America, in America, six young children commit suicide. Folks, that's an average of 42 kids a week. A year ago, Christmas time, I tried to call a pastor down in South Carolina. He didn't take my call. And then several hours later in the afternoon, he texted me and said, I'm sorry I couldn't take your call this morning. I was dealing with the parents of a 12-year-old boy who took his own life this morning. Folks, it happens 42 times a week. Every day in America, on an average day, 13 children are homicide victims. Many of them at the hands of their own parents. On an average day in America, 5,753 children are arrested. On an average day in America, 1,329 babies are born of teenage mothers, for the most part unwed mothers. Several years ago, I was doing a meeting in Ward, and you all know where Ward is, I'm sure. And a lady came up to the church afterwards. We're talking, you know, just a rural area, kind of a small town USA, what Ward is. And she said, that, she said, last year, here in our little country school, three of our sixth graders delivered babies before the year was over. When a nation turns its back on God, who gets hurt the worst? It is going to be our children. There's a job to do. On an average day in America, 367 children are arrested for drug abuse. We were doing a crusade up in Pennsylvania. One afternoon, I'm knocking doors with the pastor. We're going door to door. Came to this one door where they had two adult women living there and then six kids. No men in the family, no men in the house, but six kids there and then two, two women. And as we left the house, pastor said, do you see what was inside that house? 
I said, no, sir, I, my attention was on the kids. He said the worst of the worst of hardcore pornography lining the walls of that family, of that home where all these kids are living. But what troubled me, I'm talking with a girl on the porch. She's 11 years old. And I'm telling her about the crusade that night and the gospel magic and all that. And she said, I can't come tonight. I said, why not? It's going to be an awesome time, a really fun time. She said, well, I have an appointment with my parole officer. She's 11 years old, 11 years old. On an average day in America, 34 children die from accidents. On an average day in America, more than 17,000 public school children are suspended from school. What's the answer to all this? Well, we need a better educational system. We need more federal funding. We need a better environment. The bottom line is these kids need the Lord Jesus, don't they? They need the gospel, and that's why we're here this week. Again, please look past the fun, the games, and what we call the gospel magic, the illusions, and penny offering and all that. Look past that. The reason we're here is to preach the gospel and see people saved. Please come. Please come praying. And please ask God to use you to reach others. Elma and I usually go out on Monday afternoon and Tuesday afternoon and just go door to door, and we have some tricks like squirting nickel, and we make balloon animals and stuff. There are certain people that we can reach just by talking with them on their porch. There are certain people that you can reach if you talk with them. Every one of us have a circle of influence, don't we? And my circle of influence doesn't miss mass pastors or yours. You have your own. And so talk to the people in your circle, people that you know, maybe some people you don't even know, and see if they can come. We were at Walmart one time, and this man comes walking in, a, a, a man and a woman and, and three kids. And the man is just covered from head to toe with tattoos and every person you can imagine. We went up and talked with him, made balloons for his kids, and got him a gospel flat tract and invited him to come to the crusade. As far as I know, he didn't come. But you know what he said before we walked away? He said, thank you for not judging me. I said, sir, we're both brothers in, in the human family here. We, we, we're brothers. Why would I judge you? And, and he just reached out to him. I mean, he just felt like we'd, we'd touched his heart by, by doing that. Let's go to the, the syllabus that you have. I think the syllabus got out to everybody. Does anybody need a pen? I want to keep you writing for a few minutes here, if I may. Sometimes you remember what you see, what you read, if you'll, if you'll write it down as well. Okay, does anybody need a pen? Okay, yeah. Somebody get a Janice? Okay, good. And does that pen work? You always want to find that out. Okay, four qualities that make a child of and fruitful. Why is children's ministry so, so easy? Why the, is the harvest so easy? And by the way, we're going to have a workers' meeting right after church. Let's preempt that, and we'll try to cover some details right now. I want to ask you as adults, when you walk into the auditorium, uh, we want the kids to come up front. A lot of times they'll, they'll pack the front rows, and that's good. That's what we want. But I need you to be seated among the kids, if you would, please, okay? If you walk in, and there's two or three rows of kids, and no adults, just make them scoot over, jump in, and sit, sit right with them, okay? And as you sit among the kids, pray for them, pray for the crusade, be praying, be singing, participating. And then my wife, before service each night, will approach three of you and ask you to be a secret agent. Agent. Now, if you're a secret agent, you're going to sit someplace where you see the whole crowd at one glance. That's the night you don't want to be on the front row, okay? If you're a secret agent, don't sit on the front row. You'll have all these kids behind you, okay? So kind of that night, sit toward the outside of the crowd or toward the back of the crowd. And one of you is picking the quietest boy. One's picking the quietest girl. And one's picking a third person, third window, which can be a boy or a girl. And that's all through the entire service you're watching, okay? At the end of the service, before we dismiss, I'll say, who's picking the best girl? And you stand up and say, okay, girl over there in the purple. And you identify the winner. She and two other winners come up and they play the minute to win it game. And then we, we all go home. And Elmo will change it every night so the kids never know who the secret agents are, okay? I give the kids two rules for this contest. Number one, sit up straight. Then number two, no talking. And I found out if they work on those two things, everything else pretty much falls into place, okay? So I don't give them a whole bunch of rules, just those two. And so the last thing you do before you dismiss, you identify your, you identify your winner, they come up and play the game. And then we'll change it every night, okay? Now, um, when we do a Bible game, and this is after the invitation, we've had the Bible message, we've had the invitation, maybe people are being counseled with, we'll have a Bible, a Bible game, and I'll ask a question, a kid in the crowd honks a bicycle horn, seven kids jump the same split second, your job is to pick the first one up as the spotter, okay? And so we're just asking Bible questions from the Bible message, reviewing the game, and then you're just helping us choose the, the first person that stands up. When we start the invitation, and this will be, let me back up for a minute. We have somebody doing the kid, little kids' class every night, right? About half an hour into the program, we'll dismiss all the little kids. I think we'll have Bong with the bear here. I think he's planning to be here. And he'll take all the little kids out to class. If you would, as workers, look around you. And if we have a couple of kids that are obviously too young to be in here, staying in here, encourage them to slip out to class, if you would. What happens in class, they'll enjoy probably more than what happens in here, okay? And then... Um, Anyway, then when we start the invitation after the message, Pastor, as soon as people bow their heads, would you come walking down front and stand? And as I'm having a show of hands, how many are saved, how many are not saved, how many are not sure? You can see who's raising hands if you would do that. If you're a counselor and planning to help us with the invitation and the counseling, wait till we start the invitation song, please. 
Don't come down front when pastor does, okay? He comes down front. He's watching the show of hands. Then we'll have a brief word of prayer and then the invitation of song, I've decided to follow Jesus. And I suppose we ought to have you and the counselors just go to the back, shouldn't we, because we're going that direction. So when the invitation of song starts, you open your mouth to sing that first note. That's your cue. Step out, walk back there, and stand beside the pastor. We do it that way because sometimes a kid wants to come, and they turn to look down that aisle, and there's nobody moving. They're afraid to be the first one. And I'm seeing that more and more as time goes by. They're just afraid to step out and be the first one. And so if you're walking down the aisle, that might be the only encouragement they need. They'll join you and go out, and then somebody shares the gospel, and they get saved. So do it that way if you would. Now, if you're a counselor, I want to ask you to take your Bible. Please use your Bible. And then go through the entire plan of salvation. They've just heard it a few minutes before in the message itself. But you've got this ideal one-on-one counseling situation I didn't have. You can ask them questions. They can ask you questions. And so I want to ask you to do that. So go through the entire scripture again. Go through the Bible verses. Explain the plan of salvation. Ask them questions. See if they're understanding. Let them ask you questions, okay, as they go through the plan. Now, what do you do if they're not ready? There's no conviction of sin. They're confused. You're getting strange answers to your questions. If they're not ready... I would go ahead and complete the plan of salvation one more time just so they hear the gospel and sing those verses one more time. But please stop short of pushing them through a decision they're not ready for. If they're not ready, say, listen, Keisha, I'm glad you came tonight. And I'm sure glad you're thinking about getting saved. And listen, I don't think you understand everything tonight. Come back tomorrow night. We'll talk about this again tomorrow night. And I'll be here and I can talk with you. Leave it open-ended and, then for, and actually pray for them. I mean, just pray throughout the day. Lord, help her to understand. And then watch for the night. Sometimes you see the same child come down the, the aisle three or four nights in a row and then finally get saved one night. That's not a problem at all, okay? Just encourage them to come back if they would. If they are ready, if they're ready, there's conviction of sin, there's understanding of the gospel, then lead them to pray and receive the Lord as their Savior. And let me say this, I always try to start the message about 20, or not the message, the invitation, about 22 minutes before dismissal time. That gives you this 20-minute window, this 20-minute block of protected time. You don't have to just rush through the plan. Okay, look at this verse. Hey, pray this prayer. You have all the time in the world to do it carefully, prayerfully, asking questions, letting that. So you've got the time to do that, okay? Like I said, you've got a good solid 20 minutes probably. Four reasons why child evangelism is so fruitful. Okay, number one, childhood is a believing age. Children must trust in others. I have dealt with thousands and thousands of, of, of kids in my, in, my, uh, mess, in my ministry to the kids over the years. I've never had a child look at me when I present the gospel and say, I don't believe that. I've never had a kid say that. I've had a few teenagers tell me that, and I've had multiple adults tell me that, but not once have I ever had a child tell me that. Children believe, don't they, so readily. Secondly, childhood is a sensitive age. The conscience is never keener than it is during the first 12 years. You show a child that he's a sinner or she's a sinner, they want a Savior. They feel the guilt. They, they want to be forgiven. That's natural for them. Number three, childhood is affectionate age. Children are creatures of love, and they respond to love. You show the average child the love of Jesus on Calvary, and the natural response of a child is to love the Savior who loved him. That's a natural. And then number four, childhood is a teachable age. Children are alert. They're attentive. They're keen. Again, you present the gospel to a child, they're not going to argue with you. And they usually, from my experience, don't say, I don't believe that. I've never had a child say that. When I, I don't write anything down on this one, but just look at this for a moment. I was in a church in western Pennsylvania, and I came down the fellowship hall, downstairs to the fellowship hall. At the bottom of the stairs was a four-bay uh, bulletin board, and this is what it said. I, I, I copied it down word for word. This is the gospel. Have you obeyed it? Now look at it. Don't write anything down here yet, but just look at this. Number one, I'm separated from God because of my sin, Romans 3.23. We would agree with that. Number two, God is perfect and he loves me, 1 John 4.10. We'd agree with that. Number three, if I believe God about Jesus and trust Jesus to save me from my sin, he will when I ask him, Romans 10, 9, 10, 13. Number four, I'm born into God's family, become his child, belong to him forever, John 1.12. This is the gospel. Have you obeyed it? Now, they're presenting the plan of salvation from Scripture. Look at it carefully. What did they omit? There's something major missing here. Do you see it? There's no mention of the cross. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15. The death, the burial, the resurrection, or our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Folks, my whole message, the the center point of my message, the, the message from the Scripture centers on the cross of Calvary. Without the cross of Calvary, there is no redemption. There is no salvation. There's no forgiveness of sin. Now, I don't think it was deliberate. Surely it wasn't deliberate. Just an oversight. But what an oversight. I'm saying this. When you present the plan of salvation, present it just as thoroughly and prayerfully and carefully as you possibly can. 
I've got a teacher training module from one of the large publishing houses, and one of the modules is teaching teachers how to present the gospel to kids and how to lead a child to Christ. Here's the plan of salvation as they give it. Just the, the main points. Number one, God loves you. Number two, you sin. Number three, God will forgive you. Number four, ask Jesus to be your Savior. Now again, what's missing? They didn't even mention the cross of Calvary. We would agree the different points from Scripture that they're giving there, but the focus of our message is always on the cross of Calvary. We can't omit that. Let's imagine just for a moment we're in children's church. You're a third grade boy or girl, and I'm going to present the gospel to you just the way we would in junior church. This morning what I want to do is take the Word of God, the Bible. We can trust the Bible. Amen? Yes. You're not third graders apparently. Amen? Okay, good. Okay. We can trust the Bible. What I want to do is show you from God's Word, the Bible, what a person needs to know and believe to be saved by the Lord Jesus. Three things. Here's number one. Say it with me. I am a sinner. Again, I am a sinner. When I'm presenting a plan of salvation with kids, I always have them say each of the points twice. There's always going to be a kid that's looking down and miss it, whatever, then he'll catch it the second time. So I always do it twice. And then I'm usually having the kids define what sin is. Then we go to Romans 3.23, a, a perfect verse for this point. Say the verse with me together. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. What's the second word in the verse? And who would that include? Every single one of us. Amen? How about me? Oh, yes. We're sinners. Okay, what's number one? Say it again. I am a sinner. Number two is the gospel. Here's the good news. Say it with me. Jesus died for my sins. Again, Jesus died for my sins. Now, there are a couple things under this point. Number one, make sure the kids understand who Jesus is. Jesus was a great leader, a great teacher, a really good man. He's more than that. Jesus Christ is God. John chapter 1 tells us he's the creator. Now think of that. Here's the creator of the universe, God Almighty, dying on a cross in my place. That's incredible, isn't it? There's a second thing also. Anytime you mention the cross of Calvary, always, 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 always mention the resurrection. We live in what we call post-Christian America. 25 years ago, preacher, if I'm on the street doing balloons, I'd say, hey, kid, what do you want? He said, I don't know. I said, well, let me do Jonah and the Whale. He said, oh, yeah, cool. Now he says, Joe who? He's never heard of Jonah and the Whale. Now, here's a kid who has never been in church, has no, no relation to the gospel. He's never heard it. And I'm presenting the gospel to the, for the first time to him. And I forget to mention the resurrection. I'm just assuming he knows about the resurrection. And I'm telling him Jesus died. And he's thinking, well, how can Jesus help me? You told me he's dead. I'm assuming he already knows about the resurrection. You see what I'm saying? Anytime you mention the cross of Calvary, mention the resurrection. Don't assume that people already know. What verse would you use? I love Romans 5, 8. Together. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. So again, number two, Jesus died for my sins. And then number three, and this is so important, say it with me, I must receive Jesus as my Savior. Again, I must receive Jesus as my Savior. Our Bible teaches us salvation is a free gift. We receive it by faith, by grace through faith. We don't work for it, we don't earn it, we don't deserve it. It's a free gift. Are you aware of the fact that most religions in this world teach that salvation is a reward we earn by being good? Sure. You think all the major religions, they teach, do this, do this, do this, earn your salvation, and God says, no, salvation is a free gift. Read this verse with me. I love it. Together. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Now look at the verse. What is it we deserve because of our sin? We deserve death. What does God want to give us that we don't deserve? The free gift of eternal life. That's incredible, isn't it? I deserve death because of my sin. And a God who loves me says, no, I don't want to give you that. I'll give you something you don't deserve. And in his grace and his love for me and his love for you, he gives us the gift of salvation instead of giving death. What's number three? Say it again. I must receive Jesus as my Savior. And so if you're here this morning at Children's Church, you've never received Jesus as your Savior, here's how to do that. Number one, just tell God you're sorry for your sin. The Bible says repent. Ask God to turn you from your sin. Ask for his forgiveness. Number two, believe that Jesus loved you and died for you and rose again the third day. And then number three, by faith, just believe in him. Ask him to be your savior. He'll forgive your sins, give the gift of eternal life. You can know you're going to heaven. So there's the plan of salvation. Just the simplest way I know to present it. One night I heard a man say getting saved is as simple as ABC. 
And I thought about that. I thought we could take those three letters, A, B, C, let them stand for the same three points in the plan of salvation. A would stand for the word admit. Say it with me. Admit that you are a sinner. Again, I'd use Romans 3.23. B would stand for the word believe. Say it with me. Believe that Jesus died for you. And I would use Romans 5.8 again. C would stand for the word call. Say it with me. Call on Jesus to save you. In this case, since I'm using the word call, I would also use Romans 10.13. Romans 10.13 has the word call. Say the verse with me together. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10.13. So here's a simple way to send, present the plan of salvation in a way the kids will remember the, th the three points. I did this in a, in a church in Olympia, Washington several years ago and on Monday night. On Tuesday night, they were offloading the bus. A little boy came running in, probably seven or eight years old, and he saw the ABC on the screen. I was focusing the projector, but it didn't have the words up there, just the ABC. That was always up there. And he stopped and looked. I said, I know that. I said, what is it? And he gave it to me word perfect. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus died for you. C, call on Jesus to save you. He had seen it one time the night before and remembered it. It's just a memory device you can use, okay? Admit, believe, call. Now let's say we're in children's church. We do a salvation message. We're going to give them an invitation and invite the kids to receive the Lord as their Savior. How do we present that invitation? And we'll do, be doing some of these, following some of these guidelines tonight as we do it. Number one, make your invitation, say it with me, specific. Each child must understand what you want him to do. What kind of a decision are you asking him to make? A salvation decision? A decision he's going to be a witness to his friends? A decision that he's going to walk with God and, and read his... You know, what is the decision? Make it very clear, okay? Number two, be brief. Be brief. If God is speaking, they'll respond without your belaboring the invitation. Now, I think if you're working with adults sometimes, a, there may be a call for a 10-minute or 12-minute invitation. You sing 15 verses just as I am, you know? But when you're working with kids, you don't need that. If we have to extend the invitation, keep pushing and pushing and pushing, perhaps we're trying to do the work instead of the work of the Holy Spirit of God. He's the one that draws. Okay? So it should be brief. Number three, the invitation should be, say it with me. Say it again. One more time. The invitation should be voluntary. Never force a child to respond. And that should go without saying, but I've seen just the opposite more than once, folks. I used to work at a large junior church in Arizona. Not in Arizona, Southern California, when I was in college, we had just the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, just the juniors. We, every Sunday, we'd have like six or seven hundred juniors, and every Sunday, we'd have about a hundred juniors get saved, week after week, month after month after month. And Brother Brooks, I sat back in one day just doing some thinking. In an average year's time, I'm going to guess we might have uh, 1,800 to 2,000 different kids come through our junior church in a year's time, okay? And somehow, out of 2,000 kids, we see 5,200 of them get saved. No, something was wrong there. In our junior church, if you raised your hand, you were not saved or not sure. Once you raised your hand, it was no longer your choice whether you came or not. I mean, a worker came to you, and if you weren't ready to go, they would actually pull you by the arm and drag you down the aisle. I've seen workers pick up kids that didn't want to come and carry them down the aisle. Now, folks, I have a passion to see kids get saved. That is my life's calling. I live to see God, God save kids. But I've got to remember, this is not my work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit of God. I can present the gospel. I can try to show them the beauty of being saved and being forgiven, but it has to be their decision. It has to be the Holy Spirit drawing them. It has to be voluntary. Number four, make it clear as to what kind of response you want. Okay? You, the child wants to come and get saved. Uh, what does he do? Does he come and stand beside you? Does he walk to the back door and meet a worker down there? Does he raise his hand? Does he pray right in his seat? What does he do? Make it very clear. And by the way, let me say that that would go for adult invitations as well. Many times I'll see, we'll have a pastor preach on Sunday morning, they'll preach an excellent salvation message. Then he stands to the pulpit and says, folks, won't you come to Christ? Won't you come? And here's this businessman thinking, okay, how do I come? What do I do? Make it very clear. I think it'd be good to say, listen, folks, with their heads bowed and eyes closed in just a moment, we're going to sing an invitation song. If you're sitting there and you're not saved, you're not sure, would you consider doing this? And you come down to the pulpit and standing on the floor down here, you say, as we sing that song, if you're not saved, you're not sure, would you just come and speak with me? Here's what I'll do. I'll have one of our counselors take a Bible, take you to a quiet counseling room, and show you again from the Word of God how to receive the Lord as your Savior. What have I done? I showed them how to respond, and I'm told them what we're going to do when they respond. So give them information. Okay? And then number five, number five, make it in love. Christ's love. It is Him to whom they're responding. Okay, let's go to the invitation room itself. Pastor, what time do I dismiss Sunday school? Okay.
Okay, we should be good. Okay. Okay, let's say we're in children's church on Sunday morning. We had a salvation message. A little boy comes to get saved. A little girl comes to get saved. How do we deal with those kids? Okay. Number one, talk with the child alone, if at all possible. The ideal counseling situation for kids or for teens or for adults is to always do one-on-one -on -one if you possibly can. Now, I've been in situations where we had 60 kids come to get saved and only have a dozen workers, and each worker takes five kids. Okay, that can, that can work, but the ideal, if you can, is to go one-on-one. -on -one. Now, let me say this. Years ago, we'd always tell workers, you know, go in the classroom, close the door, just you and the child. In today's society, dare not do that, okay? You have to be very careful. Leave a door open, have another, another uh, person, another counselor with you. But anyway, make sure that you can't be accused of anything. If you're accused of anything in impropriety, you're guilty until proven innocent, not the other way around. The fact that you're a churchgoer will not be used in your defense. It will be used against you. Whether you're male or female, if you're accused of anything, you're guilty. So I'm just saying be very, very cautious, very cautious, okay? Number two, always ask him his name or her name, and then use it as you introduce him or her to the Savior. That's not absolutely necessary. I just think it makes it more, more, a warmer, more personal uh, situation if you do that, okay? Number three, ask him questions. By the way, when you first get in there, before you even start the plan of salvation, just uh, make small talk for a moment or two. My name is Mr. Ed. That's what they'll call me. What is your name? Michael. Michael, what grade are you in school? Michael, where do you, you know, just ask a few leading questions, get him responding to you. Then as you go into the plan of salvation, you're asking questions, and he's still responding to you, hopefully. Now, when you ask questions here, stay away from yes or no questions exclusively. Do you believe you're a sinner? Uh-huh. You believe Jesus died for you? Uh-huh. Would you like to get saved? Uh-huh. Okay, we don't know if you're ready or not. Okay, pray this prayer. We don't know. Instead, ask why questions. Why did you come to the invitation? Why do you need to be saved? Why did Jesus die for you? Why can you not go to heaven if you don't receive Jesus? A why question elicits more than just a nod of the head or shake of the head. That child has to verbalize, and that gives you some feedback. You can tell where they are, okay? So make use of questions. Number four, present the plan of salvation simply. You see what well, Pastor Brooks just presented a few moments ago. It's an excellent message. It was so clear. But you have this ideal one-on-one -on -one counseling situation Pastor didn't have, okay? So go through the entire plan of salvation again. Number five, use what? Say it again. So many times, Elmo will come up to you after service and say, you know, the counselors came and not a single counselor had a Bible with them when they came. So I'm assuming they're going to take a child or a teenager or whoever back to a counseling room, maybe at least quote scripture to them. But I suggest that it's better to actually take your Bible, open to the verses of scripture you're using, and have that counselee read the verse from the page of the Bible with you. Therefore, they're saying this is the source of the truth I'm sharing with you. This is not what Pastor Brooks taught me. This is what the Bible says. The truth I'm sharing with you came from the Word of God. Okay, so use your Bible. We were in a church up in, in Tennessee, way in the hills, just a country church in the middle of Tennessee somewhere up in the hills. And on, Monday, on Sunday night, I'm having a workers' meeting before service, and I'm telling the counselors how we're going to go next door to a counseling room. And the pastor said, no, sir, we don't go anywhere. I said, well, this is your church. Tell us how you want to do it. He said, well, just counsel with the kids right up front at the altar. I said, okay. When we started the invitation, he came and actually sat. It's kind of a bench-type altar, and he sat on the altar. And a little old lady came and sat on the altar on the other side. And then as the kids came, they just grabbed the kid and hugged him up to himself, body to body, and whispered in their ear for about five minutes and released him and grabbed the next kid. No Bibles were opened. Same thing on Monday. And so Tuesday afternoon, I saw a pastor before church. as a preacher. Tonight, during our invitation, would you ask our counselors to use their Bibles, please? He said, we have Bibles. I said, sir, nobody has opened a Bible. Nobody's even brought a Bible to the altar. Nobody, I know nobody's opened one. Let's use our Bibles, please. Make sure you use the Bible. Number six, use only a few verses. You may know six or eight or ten verses for the first point that talk about the sinfulness of man. You don't have to take that counsel lead to every verse you know. Usually just one or two for each of the points, and the Holy Spirit of God can use those. Okay. Number seven, take time. Don't be in a hurry. Don't just rush through it. And by the way, if you're planning, let's say you're in charge of junior church, children's church, don't plan your invitation two minutes before dismissal time. Try to plan your invitation, you know, 12 or 14 minutes maybe ahead of time before dismissal. And have a Bible game or something, follow the invitation, but give time for the counselors to deal with those people that come so not just rushing through this, hey, pray this prayer, sign this card, you're on. Uh, take time. Number eight, if the child is ready, ask him to receive the Lord as Savior. Now, let me back up for a second. Let's say he's not ready. She's not ready. There's no conviction of sin. Uh, they're, they're, you're getting confused answers. You get strange answers to questions. It's obvious they're not ready yet. What do you do at that point? The last thing you want to do is push them the decision, through a decision they're not ready for. If they're not ready, I say, listen, listen, Timothy, I'm glad you want to get saved, and, and I'm glad you're interested in this, but I don't think you understand everything we're talking about tonight. 
why don't you get back again next week and, and, and I'll be here next week and we can talk again and I'll pray for you that you'll get saved real soon. Make it very obvious to that little guy, that little girl, they did not get saved just because they came down the aisle and talk with you. And then keep your word and probably pray for them. If we're in a five-night crusade like we're at this week, I'll just say, hey, come tomorrow night. I'll be here tomorrow night. If it's a weekly thing where you're running the bus once a week, you have to say, well, next week. But all through that period of time, be praying for them that God will speak to their heart. Okay, let's say they are ready. Here's this little eight-year-old girl. She understands the gospel. She's troubled by her sin. There's conviction of sin. She, she understands the gospel. What do we do at that point? Then you want to lead her to pray and actually receive the Lord as her Savior. And quite often, American kids have never seen anybody pray. They don't know anything about prayer. They've never seen Dad pray over supper. And so they look at you and say, I don't know how to pray. And I say, listen, listen, Timothy, why don't you just tell God you know you're a sinner? Tell him you believe that Jesus died and rose again and just simply ask him to save you and he will. And usually the kids say, oh, okay, and here comes a prayer from his heart. But sometimes even then I had to look at me and say, well, I still don't know how. Now, this is just my opinion. Take it or leave it, okay? But I think it's appropriate to say, listen, Timothy, I'll help you with the words. But you have to remember, I'm not asking Jesus to save you. You're the one turning from your sin. You're the one asking Jesus to save you. And then just help with a sentence prayer, just a sentence at a time. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sin. You know, just a sentence at a time. Okay? It has to be them turning to the Lord in faith. Number nine, give assurance of salvation. Give assurance of salvation. This child has just gotten saved. This adult has just gotten saved. This teenager, whatever. Go back to scriptures and give them assurance. Now, you could just give verbal assurance, couldn't you? Keisha, I'm glad you got saved. Hey, I'll see you in heaven one day, girl. Good decision. Glad you did that. What has she got? She's got your word for it. That's not good enough. Rather than just give her verbal assurance, go back to Scripture. Use what? Use the Bible. Use the Bible. Maybe use Romans 10, 13 to lead her to the Lord. Take her back to Romans 10, 13 and, and use that for assurance. Or John 3, 36. Or John 5, 24. Or some of the verses in 1 John 5, verses 10 through 13. Excellent, excellent assurance verses. Take her back. Take him back to Scripture. Okay? And then number 10, briefly, briefly give guidelines for Christian growth. Write down five words here. Bible, prayer, confession. Again, Bible, prayer, confession, church, baptism. Bible, prayer, confession, church, baptism. Just five things that need to be part of a new believer's life. And just taking a couple minutes just to explain some of those things or try to walk them through it. Perhaps later on you go to their house and talk with the parents and tell them about the salvation experience and have a chance to talk with the child again. But anyway, just those five points briefly uh, before you dismiss them from the invitation time. We're almost out of time, but let me just you this. Years ago, I went on staff at a large church in Phoenix, Arizona. I was just out of Bible college. I've been out of Bible college for about a year, brand new to ministry, excited about ministry. And I was in charge of the children's ministries there. And we ran, it was a large church. We ran 1,000 or 1,100 on a typical Sunday. Uh, we ran eight buses. I, I think our average was 370 year-round for those, those eight buses. And, and I, I had a bus route, but I also had my own children's church. I had the juniors, which is the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Probably the second or third Sunday I was there. I'm brand new on staff. I'm brand new to the ministry, you know. And the teachers who taught the primaries, so and that's the first, second, third graders, those teachers brought a little boy to me before class or after class, one or the other, and said, this little guy, this is Scott Bass. He's the meanest kid in the world. They actually said that in front of him. They said he fights, he cusses, he slugs teachers. We can't teach if he's in class. We want you to tell Scott he can never come back. I said, no, Scott needs the Lord. He needs to be saved. They said, you don't understand. We can't teach if Scott's in class. I said, folks, he needs to be saved. They said, look, you either tell him he can't come back or we quit right now. I thought, wow, they're serious. And they didn't cover that one in Bible college. So I thought, what do I do with this? I said, tell you what, I want Scott here. He needs to be saved. Next Sunday when Scott comes, he can come in my junior church. I know he's not old enough, but he's not your problem any longer. He's mine. I'll t Scott's mine. Scott walked into junior church next Sunday and found out real fast he was the meanest kid in the world. We had the Samsonite folding chairs. You've seen those. Scott walks down the aisle, and as he walks down the aisle, he takes the chair on the end and just picks it up and flips it. Just comes down the aisle flipping chairs. He takes a seat on the second row on this side, and during the first song, the very first song, I'm in the back, I saw him do it. George Cisneros, my song leader, is up front leading songs, and Scott's sitting behind a hulking sixth grader who probably outweighs him by 40 pounds. I mean, this kid is a lot bigger than Scott was. During the first song, Scott reaches up and pops that kid in the back of the head. Boom! I'm in a third grader picking on a sixth grader, okay? He gets out of his seat, comes around, and the kid's holding his head and crying, and Scott gets in his face, and he's mocking him. And I'm thinking, flatten him, kid, flatten him. You know, I could have taken care of him in a heartbeat. Scott, 
I can't describe his behavior. He was the worst kid I'd ever dealt with. And we'd have fights with officers. And you, you start to reprimand Scott, and the worst language you can imagine come out of that kid's mouth. I mean, he was just a terror. And he's tearing our junior church apart. But either the third or fourth Sunday he was there, guess what happened? Scott Vass got saved. I thought, hallelujah, end of problem. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I'm glad Scott got saved. Next Sunday, seven days later, we haven't been in junior church five minutes, and Scott's already in a fight. A teacher's trying to break it up. Scott's screaming. He's punching the teacher. I mean, he's kicking. He's fighting. I looked at him. Up. Scott got saved last Sunday? No way. There's no change. But it seemed like the Lord just said, hey, Scott has to grow. I approached the situation. I said, Scott, and he turned around and started to deck me. He saw who it was, and he stopped. I said, Scott, did you get saved last Sunday? And he stopped. It's called thoughtful across his face. He said, uh, yeah, yeah, I really did. I said, Scott, if you got saved last Sunday, you belong to Jesus now. Don't you want to please him? And again, this thoughtful look across his face. The fist just kind of went down and disappeared. And he said, yeah, I, I do, I do. And he went and sat down. He's just as good as he can be for the rest of the teaching hour. Slowly, 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 over a period of months, weeks and months, we saw Scott Vass, one of the meanest kids I've ever dealt with in my entire life, become Scott Vass, a little third grade boy who loved the Lord Jesus with all his heart. He became aware of the fact that most people he knew were not saved. And Scott began to bring cousins and neighbors and people from school to church, not to win a contest or get a prize, but just see him saved. He, tried, he brought his little brothers, who were four and six years old, and said, Brother Ed, show them how to get saved. And I said, well, keep them coming. They'll learn about how to be saved. That little boy who was a terror in class became a little guy who was absolute joy to have in class. He had such an enthusiasm for the Savior and loved the Lord so much, such a great way. That's the ministry to which we're called, aren't we? It's not us presenting the gospel and saying and, and changing them. It's the Holy Spirit of God working through us and seeing them saved and seeing them grow and seeing them change. That's what this ministry is all about. Please, during this week, be praying. Please bring people with you if you possibly can. Come every single night if you possibly can. If you're working a second shift job one night, you know, don't quit your job, but anything short of that, plan to be here if you possibly can. I think you'll enjoy what happens, and we're asking God to give some harvest of souls, okay? I'm hoping to give some, this is a little bit different, I know, for a Sunday school hour, but I want to give you some information possibly that you may be even use to lead your grandkids to the Lord, that type of thing, and have ministry here. It's just some things that we can use in our ministry. Pastor, do you come and close us in prayer, and then we'll transition to the next service in just a moment here.